down. And I'm going to prove that to you by implementing the, um, the link from scene one to scene two and maybe even back. And that'll be where this tutorial takes us today. So I'd like to do some mouse cursor stuff. Uh, let me go ahead and open up game loop in another tab here in Xcode. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to have a method here for set cursor and I'd like to have this take an integer argument which is one of these cursor things grouping my code here like so and what set cursor is going to do is set the mouse cursor equal to the argument the, symbol, uh, the symbolic constant if the person calling this was an asshole and they tried to crash our program which would only be me so I don't really know why I'm doing this but it just in case if this happens, we don't do anything because this would be an invalid index and we're into an array and it would crash. So that sets the mouse cursor. And I expose this method because we're going to want to call that from scene based off of which region we're in. So basically what we're going to do here is we're going to check links. We're going to iterate through each link for auto link links. I use a reference parameter here because if I don't, I think what happens is it'll, it'll, it'll create a copy every time on my struct, just inefficient. Uh, I'm not 100% sure on that, but it doesn't hurt to use a reference parameter to be uh, efficient here. So we're going to check each link based off of the mouse. And this is pretty simple. We basically want to see if MX is greater than link region X, Y. What this is doing is it's a test to make sure that we're inside the box. Did I use two? No, okay. X plus width would give us the right hand side of the rectangle. We want to make sure we're less than that in both X and Y. Now there's one off chance that GIMP <laughs> was using zero as the top of the screen and SDL might be using zero as the bottom. If that's the case, I'll have to flip the mouse before I do this test. We'll find out pretty quickly if that's the case because we'll see the wrong regions here. But the idea here is if we're inside uh, this region, um, then we're going to set the cursor. We're assuming the regions won't overlap here. If they do, then the last one checked will win. Um, this is only for mouse hovering. We haven't clicked anything yet, as you'll notice. As a matter of fact, um, I wouldn't mind having another method here for uh, um, handle mouse press, I guess. I don't know if I like that. I'm supposed to say mouse pressed. Well, that'll that'll be our mouse click handler. Started to realize like how ADD I really am when I code. There's no reason for me to do that just now. Sorry about that. <laughs> so anyway, we're inside the region. We then want to call game loop. Set mouse cursor to link cursor. And that should give us our cursor. If we find out that we are not inside any of the links, then we reset the mouse cursor equal to the default cursor. I don't know if scene is the proper place to do this, but I don't want to sp split my logic up too much. You know, so I'm going to go ahead and do that from here. And the idea here is we're going to go ahead and do game loop cursor normal if we're not inside anything. So if I didn't mess this up, the information from our file that we parsed should cause the fuck. <laughs> it didn't work. I'm ruined. Uh, okay, let's, let's try to find out what the hell happened here. So I know for a fact here I should be considered as inside one of these things. So let's see if the breakpoints are hit for me to be inside. So according to, okay, so I did go inside uh, one of the, the, the regions just now. So this should be changing the cursor. Let me make sure I'm drawing things right with the right mouse cursor. Yeah, according to this, I should, wait, wait, yeah, I should be, um, let me make sure I'm not ending up in this. So let's try that out. If the cursor is zero, less than zero or it's greater than eight, we should return, which shouldn't be the case. 
So the mouse cursor should be being set to two. Two is not the default cursor. The only thing I can assume is that um, I'm setting it back every time. In other words, I'm setting it and then immediately. Oh, this should be not. This should this should be if I'm not inside any. That's my fault. Cool. Uh, it works because this is in the right place. So as you can see, the mouse cursor changes to a cue, a visual cue to tell you that if you were to click here, it would go to the next scene. And we are going to make that work, and then that'll probably be this video because it's probably getting pretty long here. So let's go ahead and implement our call to mouse pressed. I love how I, whenever I make multiple tabs, I always end up having them all be the same file anyway. Um, so this is pretty basic. I, there are multiple ways to check to see if the mouse is pressed, but if we want to do it on just one click, kind of like an event, it's best to do it in the uh, SDL event uh, handling loop and not uh, with polled input. Uh, so the way I'm going to do that is uh, case SDL mouse button down. I don't care if it's the right or left mouse button yet, so I'm not going to check which button that is. I'm just going to go ahead and call directly into our scene mouse down, mouse pressed. Uh, it wouldn't hurt though to get event map, son of a bitch. Yeah. Just trying to find out inside this struct. There it is. So there's our X and Y coming in from the event. So that's where the mouse was clicked. So at this point, when the mouse button is pressed, we can call into our mouse button handler from scene, and then we can actually implement our transition. This is kind of tricky to do because I do not want to implement the code to, to, to do the transition inside the scene class because it's going to basically trigger its own destruction, and that's not a really good design pattern for this kind of stuff. So um, what might make more sense for me to do at this point, let's see, would be for me to return nothing more than the result of the mouse press, which is um, what we want the game loop class to do. This might change down the road, but I, what I'm thinking of doing at this point is maybe having this thing. Yeah, I'm probably going to pass the game loop here so that I can use the game loop pointer to drive the logic of what I want to occur. Uh, I was thinking of maybe returning like, you know, which scene to load, but that's really stupid because, you know, there's only so much information you can return in a return value without getting really dodgy. So I'd rather do it like this and then implement uh, implement a method, uh, much like I have load scene here and set cursor for uh, essentially transition um, to another scene file. Um, and the, the argument to this is going to basically be the SCN, the SCN file that I want to load as the replacement transition. So, um, again, uh, I think I mentioned this last video, uh, having multiple scenes in existence at the same time is a good idea because that allows me to have one scene exist while I use the new one to crossfade on top of it so that I can implement some kind of a transition because a sudden change in the screen would be kind of boring. And you could get really fancy with the transitions and how you want to animate those. But for right now, I'm just going to do a crossfade. So what I'm thinking of doing at this point is having a pointer to what's going to basically be called new scene or uh, incoming scene. And this will be the temporary that holds the incoming scene until it's fully faded in, in which case I swap and replace the active scene with that and then deallocate the old one. And that'll all be done uh, through C++ smart pointers for me. So um, let's go ahead and work on a transition scene. Well, let me call it first, even though it doesn't exist yet. So the same idea here is we're going to check our lengths. There's a little bit of code duplication here, but it's not the end of the world uh, for now. Um, we basically check our lengths. We have clicked the region if this is true. And if that is true, we, we basically ask game loop to transition to, uh, to the new scene. And the way we do that is, again, link has the argument for the scene file inside of it. So we do that. And um, at this point, we can assume that we're being transitioned away from. So inside my update logic, no, sorry, where the hell am I here? Uh, this was called transition scene. 
So inside uh, game loop transition scene, we initiate that process. So in this case, basically what we're going to do is we're going to set the scene, we're going to set our incoming scene equal to an instance of um, perfect, yeah, an instance of, of, of a new scene object type that's been constructed based off of the SCN file we want it to load. Um, once this uh, function returns, the new scene has been completely loaded, its SCN file has been parsed, everything that it needs to work, all this stuff is all ready to go. We just need to animate and render the transition from one to the other. So what I'd like to have here is essentially a value um, for uh, incoming fade uh, and that basically is going to be a value between 0 and 1, where 0 means the fade has not been initiated at all. Uh, I'd like to call this transition fade. Incoming doesn't make any sense. We only start this at 0. Uh, we do not allow any uh, mouse input to occur while we are in the middle of a transition. Uh, and the way that I can assert that is if somebody clicks on the mouse button while an incoming scene exists, uh, we don't allow that to happen. So I basically guard that by saying the incoming scene has to be null. And this avoids someone from clicking too quick and clicking faster than the fades are occurring, which is just a bad idea to let them do that. It causes some software programming problems. Um, because then you could have multiple scenes being loaded when they shouldn't be, or more than two. So we start the transition fade at zero, and we set the incoming scene. While we are rendering, and we know there's an incoming scene on its way, it's very simple. We basically just do incoming scene, if there's an incoming scene, in other words, it's not null. Then we use the transition fade, which we are basically going to animate between zero and one very slowly. I'm just going to think maybe like this is enough. Um, we animate the transition fade. We make sure the transition fade does not cross past one, because that would suck. And then we use an SDL uh, blend uh, to render the uh, incoming scene transparently on top of the uh, of the old one. Now, this stuff cannot be done outside of the um, of the um, scene class. It has to be done from within. So basically what I need here is I need to have uh, a field uh, called opacity here, which defaults to 1, um, but we can set it in any given time. So let me take care of that. Try, trying to find a, a good place to put it. Okay, so we set the opacity, which allows us to do, and then we enforce the opacity during render by basically if opacity is anything less than one, we set the texture blend mode for our image to blend, and then we turn it back off uh, so we don't screw up other rendering that might happen outside. Uh, again, this is just for this image, so this might be overkill. It doesn't hurt. Now, I don't exactly know how to... Um, it says it's, it's a U uh, 8, so it's between 0 and 255, so really I just do 255 times opacity, and that'll be enough uh, for me to... And I want to round that, so... That'll be enough for me to uh, probably assume this will work, fingers crossed. Um, once I have that in place, then I know that I can basically just call incoming scene set opacity uh, based off of the transition fade, which uh, will animate all the way to one. And then when it finally is finished, this is the part where I can essentially trigger. I don't like doing this inside render, but it's, it's not the end of the world. I, at this point, I can trigger the destruction of the original scene by replacing it with the incoming scene and then setting the incoming scene out to null. And what this does is essentially replaces the old one with the new one. Let's see if that works. 
So again, if I click here, nothing happens. If I click here, the game crashes. Uh, it says it can't parse the SCN file. Uh, so it means I made a mistake uh, when I was trying to, or when I wrote uh, this thing. Oh, that's hilarious. This should not be less than or equal to zero to, to trigger an error. It should be less than zero. So that was my debugging or uh, syntax checking code just making a mistake. Okay, uh, if I were to guess, I would guess that the problem I thought was not an issue before still is, and that I'm ending up with an empty directive based off of uh, that new line at the end of the file, and I'm just going to confirm that real quick. This might seem like a pain in the ass where you could have just done this in C++, but like I said, SCN files make it um, easier to... Um, that is what happened, by the way. Uh, make it easier to, to work on your game without having to program, especially if you're new at C++. It can be very frustrating when you're just trying to make your game and, and you're dealing with problems with the language. It, it makes more sense to get this stuff up and running first. Um, so what I'm going to do here is I'm pretty sure at this point I'm going to set directive equal to nothing in the beginning. And then I'm only going to allow this syntax error thing to occur if the directive is not empty. Because that's just in white space at that point. And of course, I always say what I mean the opposite of. If it's not empty, then syntax error out. Let's hope. Okay, cool. Well, we did load into the second scene, but my crossfade didn't work. Let's see what happens if I click back. Wow, it works. Uh, I just got to get the crossfade working right, uh, the alpha transparency stuff, and then um, we'll be in really good shape. I have no idea why uh, this did not work. So let me just really quickly try to find out why this didn't work. So in my infinite wisdom here, it looks like I did everything properly set up to handle the incoming scene except actually rendering it uh, when it comes time to render it. So I could set the opacity all I want, um, but I need to render it on top of the old scene so that I can essentially have the, the fade actually appear. So let me go ahead and check that. So there we go. And you'll also notice that I set incoming scene equal to null pointer, which I knew was going to come back and bite me in the ass. Uh, so it would make sense for me to take this code, which is responsible for um, uh, essentially uh, animating the transition fade and take it completely out of do render where it can do the most damage and put this inside update logic. So that way uh, everything essentially can be split up to where it, where it needs to belong. And with any luck, if I run this, I should get And I should probably make sure that incoming scene actually exists before I run this logic because if I don't do that, it'll essentially try to animate and swap my scene out with one that doesn't exist and could crash the game. So with any luck, if I run this, it should cr crossfade and it should not crash. So um, it seems like a lot of work for just about a minute of uh, quote-unquote gameplay, but um, the benefit of this is huge because as you guys could probably realize, What's driving this um, this behavior is 100% these SCN files. So now I could essentially start working on a large chunk of the adventure game completely outside of C++. Um, so that's how I would do something like this. Um, next next time I'll show you guys how to um, implement uh, the narrative stuff, so we can actually have some words appearing here to kind of. Uh, paint the mood of, uh, of our adventure game and what our adventurer might be seeing. Um, that is pretty involved uh, for reasons I'll cover next time. Um, but we're looking pretty good. Uh, we have navigation between uh, our scenes working. So cool stuff. Uh, talk to you guys next time.